that Jesus makes us alive in Him. So let's rejoice over Him.
countless testimonies that were saved by grace through faith not on my own and all along my journey the lord he went before me he was waiting there for me on mercy's road so with thankfulness, I bring this simple song. Come on, can we sing this together? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, yeah. for your grace. Every time I turn around, you were there to make a way. Whoa, thank you, Lord, for your kindness. Thank you, Lord.
the name of Jesus.
so just kind of subtle where we get crowded and the things and the burdens and even the crowns and the celebration and the lies and the doubts it it's like this subtle this subtle thing where it just starts to crowd out our heart of worship just starts to crowd out our love just starts to crowd out that that desire for Jesus and it's this beautiful song that says, you know what, I, I'm gonna choose right here in this spot, I wanna choose to surrender to the things, to the busyness, to the schedule, to all the stuff I'm gonna choose just to just to let, let go. I'm, I'm gonna lay it down at the feet of Jesus. And come on, we have a great good Father who comes in with His grace, who comes in with His mercy, who comes in with His love. And I love that second song where just this attitude of thanksgiving comes out of that. When we, when we choose individually and as a church body to make room for Him, to make room for Him. And we say, God, whatever that looks like, God, you, you shake up my preconceived notions, you shake up my stuff, I'm open to that and I'm gonna surrender all the other stuff to you. You're a good Father who loves. Can you, do, can you do something for me? Just if you're comfortable as a sign of surrender, can you lift both hands up to the Lord this morning? And this is just this sealing this moment with a declaration saying, saying God, I'm, I'm letting go of the stuff. With open hands, I'm letting go of the stuff. And God, with open hands, I'm also asking you to fill me, to restore me, to refresh me today. Come on, as I pray, can you thank him? Father, we thank you, Jesus. God, we thank you that you are a good father. We thank you that you are love. We thank you that you are grace. We thank you that you are mercy. We thank you that you have what we need today. So God, we just ask for your forgiveness today as we let go of the things that have crowded you out. God, we let go of the busyness. We let go of the doubts and the lies and the fears and the worry. God, we, let, we make a commitment to say we're done. It's yours. You can have it, the hurt and the pain and all this stuff. God, it is yours. And God, as we let go, we thank you that you're a good father who fills us with your Holy Spirit, who fills us with the grace, who fills us with refreshing and mercy and goodness. God, we thank you that you are here today. God, I pray for every individual in this room, God, that you'd, you'd move in our hearts and our lives. God, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. And we give you praise and glory and honor that's due your name. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, can you give the Lord praise today? Amen.
Amen. Amen. Man, has God been good to you? Aren't you so glad you came to church this morning? Man, we want to, on behalf of just our team, we want to welcome you here. We're so glad you're here at Faith Somerville. Hey, before you're seated, could you do me a favor? Go across the aisles, give somebody a high five, hug somebody's neck, let them know that you're glad they are here this morning. Again, welcome, welcome. We are so uh, glad you are here. We're so glad you're here. If you are new here, we just want to say again, thank you for being here. Uh, we love to meet you right after the service. We've got a little spot uh, against our map wall. It's our new here center. We got a free gift for you. And we got a team. We just want to hear your story and maybe what brought you here. And we got a free gift that we love uh, to give you. Also, um, we have an amazing opportunity for you to get connected and maybe get off the bench and get plugged in and meet some great people and find your purpose. And that is through a, a thing that we like to call Growth Track. Somebody say Growth Track. Growth Track. Growth Track is a class right out there to uh, my left, your right, uh, behind the glass doors. And again, it's just going to help you uh, every Sunday at 1030, help you get connected and hear your purpose. I will tell you that this week's a little bit different. Our growth track floor has changed it up a little bit. And those people who have gone through one, two, and three, you will meet our staff and pastors today. And so it's going to be a phenomenal time, and we'd love to have you. And then the first Sunday in April starts growth track one. So if you're thinking about that, we'd love to have you attend and, and be a part of that. We also have a, a class called In Christ, and In Christ is something that meets every Sunday at 1030, and it's an amazing opportunity for you to say, hey, what's next? What's next on my Christian journey? What's next? What, how do I find my identity in Christ? Maybe some of those basic tenets of faith uh, that you need to learn about or grow in or even get a refresher on, and we've got a class that meets uh, every Sunday at 1030. We'd love to have you. As our ushers come, I mean, it's, it's just a joy to give and sow back into the kingdom. Anybody been blessed in the house? God's blessed you. Man, um, on your way in the door, while they're coming on the way in the door, you got one of these cards. Hold them up and wave them at me. Anybody got a card in their hand? Only six of you got cards today. We got to do better on that. Oh, they, there they are. Hold, hold them out. Hey, this is a cool little card that you can take. You can take it to your workplace. You can take it to those friends. You can take it to those people that you have been praying for. I will tell you, there is something about next Sunday that is Easter Sunday, amen? And it is the, the high time of the church, but it's also a time where our community is open to an invite. They're open to spiritual things. They're open to you opening your mouth and say, hey, would you come and sit by me? Would you come and be my guest Easter Sunday? And we're believing that God is gonna do some amazing things in the hearts and lives of people. And so that's just a tool for you to take to your friends, to your neighborhood, and I encourage you to do that, amen? Amen. Father, today I thank you. God, I thank you for who you are. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to sow back into your kingdom. I thank you for all the blessings that you bestow on us to steward. And Father, as we sow back into your kingdom, I pray that you would extend this gospel here in our city and around the world. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're believing God for some amazing open doors in 2024. Good morning, Faith Church. My name is Lisa, and it's so great to have you here today. We're in week four of our series, A Psalm in Your Heart. But before your campus pastor comes up, I want to tell you about a few things that are coming up soon that you won't want to miss. Hey, ladies, Abide Women's Conference is just over a month away on April 19th and 20th at our Somerville campus. 
This conference was created to inspire, equip, and encourage you in your walk with Jesus. Because when we abide with him, we are transformed into his presence. We're so excited to announce the best-selling author and speaker, the radio host, Susie Larson, will be joining us as well as Sheila Harper, who is the director of Save One Ministries. Early bird pricing ends in March, so if you haven't registered yet, get your tickets at AbideConferenceSC.org and invite all the ladies in your life. We can't wait to see you. Easter at Faith is just a few weeks away. It's an exciting time for our church as we come together to celebrate and learn about the resurrection of Jesus. Get ready for an impactful message, family-friendly activities, and Easter festivities. Since the service tends to draw a large crowd, many of our campuses have added service times to accommodate everyone. To learn more, head over to faithishere.org slash events today. Lastly, March Madness isn't just about college basketball. This month, we're diving into March Missions Madness for Faith Kids. We'll explore the depths of God's heart for missions at home and around the world. The children will dive into the world of real life missionaries and be introduced to God's calling for all of us to become change makers. During the month of March, the kids will embrace the Boys and Girls Missions Challenge to hear the call of missions and discover their purpose for God's plan to reach the world for Christ. Hey guys, before we wrap up this week's announcements, I just want to mention a couple of very important things that you need to know. Coming up on Sunday, April 7th, at all of our campuses, we'll be having another amazing water baptism. Also on March 29th, this coming Friday, we'll be having a Good Friday service at 12 p.m. Visit faithishere.org slash events to learn more about all these events. I just want to thank you so much for tuning in today. If you're new to faith, scan the QR code down below and to catch up on all of our series, visit our YouTube channel or download our Faith mobile app. Now, check out this dope bumper and get ready for your campus pastor. The Lord is my shepherd I lack nothing He makes me lie down In green pastures And in church. Hey, good to see everybody on this Palm Sunday. What a great day of worship and praise and celebration as we celebrate the King of Glory coming into his city. Amen. Um, it, we've been in a series on the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 139 was our a great God who is omniscient, who is omnipresent, who is omnipotent. And we looked at how his greatness and his power and majesty and uh, what, a, what a week we had that week. And then Psalm 22, a couple of weeks ago, the psalm of our good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. You see Psalm 22, 23, 24 are all about shepherd psalms. And this is the good shepherd, and he gave his life for us. And, and yet, and you see the, the agony of the cross some 800 years before the cross was even used or invented in culture, and yet they portrayed down to the very last detail Everything that happened to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross. But it ended with that psalm of praise, he has done it. How many know the, the cross won our victory? Through the Lord Jesus Christ, through what he did for us. Last week was the psalm of our great shepherd who leads his sheep, who provides for his sheep, who protects his sheep, who guides us all the way until we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Today we're looking at the chief shepherd who's returning with all of his glory into Jerusalem, and we will celebrate that this morning. With that, let's stand together, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Keep your Bibles out all day. Give me a little bit more lights in the house, if you would. I want you to follow along. I want you to take notes. We're going to go a little deeper today. I want to teach you this morning from God's Word, and we're going to break down several scriptures for you and hopefully weave it all together in your understanding today. 
Luke 19 and verse 28, and after Jesus said this, said this he went on ahead up, going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a colt tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, say the Lord needs it. And those who sent ahead went and found it just as they told him. As they were untying the colt, the, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to him, Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on the, coat, on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when they came near the place where the road was going down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you, God, that you entered that city for us with a triumphal entry, but it would take you to Calvary, it would take you to the cross, and there you won the victory for us, and we thank you for that today. Lord, just as that crowd worshiped you on that Palm Sunday, may we come in our hearts and worship you, Lord, and allow the King of glory to come in. We love you so much. You are so good. Anoint me, I pray, as I bring forth your word, and we'll give you the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Today's Palm Sunday. What an amazing day a day when we celebrate the return of our king back into Jerusalem. And today, already, we've joined in the crowds. We weren't there that day, but when we come in together and we praise and we worship the Lord and we magnify him, every time we do that, we are welcoming the king of glory to come into our presence, into the house. And what a beautiful job our praise and worship team did today. I wanna tell you, I don't know about you guys, I don't wanna be replaced by a rock. How many want a rock to take your place? Not me. So every time we have a chance, let us lift our voices and worship and praise our glorious king. Now to understand the full significance of what was happening on that Palm Sunday, we've gotta go back to a prophecy by a prophet named Ezekiel. And I want you to turn, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 43 the prophet Ezekiel, and, and he prophesies, he sees in Ezekiel chapter 10 that he sees this vision of the glory of God departing out of the temple. Israel had become such a mess. They had been involved in idolatry. They allowed idolatry into the temple. They had involved, involved in all kinds of sins that were going on in the nation of Israel. This is right before their fall. And he says, I see in a vision that the, that the, the angel over the cherubim is now departing. And the glory of God is now going to go out of the temple. It's going to go out to the east of the temple. And it's going to leave Jerusalem. And he's gonna prophesy about the destruction of Jerusalem. He's gonna prophesy about the exile that's coming up to the Babylonians when, when Judah is gonna be taken into captivity. But most importantly, he's gonna talk about the glory of the God leaving the temple. I wanna tell you, when the glory of God leaves his temple, all we have left is a building. Just a building. It's nothing without his presence. It's nothing without his glory. I will tell you the truth, the same is true for Faith Church. If we don't have his presence today, we don't have anything, people. We're just singing songs and going through motions. It's all about the glory of God in his house, in his temple, in his dwelling. Glory of God. And he sees it leaving in his vision and leaving the temple area. At the end of Ezekiel's vision, though, he has this messianic prophecy. And so from Ezekiel's chapter 40 to 48, he prophesies the return of the glory of God. He prophesies about the return of the people back to, back to Jerusalem and back to Judah. And so he prophesies about the rebuilding of the temple. He prophesies all this at the end of Ezekiel. He sees the restoration of Israel. He sees the glory of God coming in on the Mount of Olives and returning back into the city of Jerusalem. Now, Look at, you would, if, if Ezekiel chapter 43, verse number one. 
Let me read this to you. Then the man brought to me, uh, brought me to the gate facing east. Notice the east. Now, now it said that it departed out of the east in Ezekiel chapter 10. Now he sees in his vision prophetically the glory of God returning from the east. And I saw the glory of God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of the rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. The vision I saw was like a vision I had seen when he came to destroy this city, and like the visions I had seen by the Kibar River, I fell face down. The glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple." Now, he has this glorious vision of the glory returning. It's a messianic vision that God gives him. When exactly did this happen in history, and when is it going to happen in history? Let me give you three places very quick where we see the glory of God coming back into his temple. The first is at his incarnation. Jesus Christ is born. He's born in Bethlehem. You know the story. Well, it comes time for Mary and Joseph to do what? Take Jesus Christ to be dedicated. And so what do they do? They go into the temple, and there they find Simeon. And Simeon says, Behold, I have seen the glory of the Lord. And he dedicates that baby. And John writes this in John chapter 1 and verse number 14. And it says there, And we have the Lord, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his what? Glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. What is happening here? We are seeing a fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy that saw in a vision a long time ago, generations before, that the glory of God would return back into Jerusalem. What happens? Jesus Christ is born, full of grace and truth, the glory, we have seen what, what we've seen, the glory of God. It was all in the person of Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He fulfills the prophecy. He goes back into Jerusalem where there he is dedicated. The second time we see the glory of God returning that could be a fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy is on that Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, what happens? I just read the story to you. He starts at the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives are on the east of Jerusalem. He starts the Mount of Olives, crosses the Kidron Valley. The crowd begins to gather around him. They're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're waving their palm branches. They're flowing out, throwing out their cloaks on the ground. What is happening? He goes through the eastern gate. He goes up into the city of Jerusalem. What is happening? The glory of God is coming back into his city. Now, before he goes in this city, he cries and he weeps over Jerusalem because they had turned away from the living God. And many of that same crowd who shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, would be the same crowd who would shout, crucify him. A few days later, but he comes in the city. The glory of God, the shouts of worship and praise and adoration. Now what is the first thing he does after he gets into the holy city? He goes into the temple. And what's the first thing he has to do into the, when he gets into the temple? He has to cleanse the temple. And so he turns over the tables of the money changers. He declares, my house shall not be a den of thieves and robbers. You've turned it into that, but my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. Now I want you to notice something. There's a definite link between the holiness of God and the glory of God. God's glory cannot dwell in unclean vessel in an unclean temple. And so for him to even go into the temple and fulfill Ezekiel's prophecy, the first thing that has to be done is the temple has to be cleansed so the glory can return. Mm, mm, mm. Verse Luke 19, 45, and when he entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. The third time, though, is yet to happen. There's going to be another time when the glory of God is going to come back into his temple. It's going to be a fulfillment of Habakkuk's prophecy when he sees a vision of the glory of the Lord covering the whole earth, right? And so let me take you to Zechariah. Zechariah writes about this day, this event, when Jesus Christ comes. He will set up his rule and reign on the earth. Listen to me, church. It is still yet to come. He is coming back. Oh, you're a sweet guy. He is coming back. 
And the Bible says in that day, the glory of the Lord will cover the whole earth. But Zechariah prophetically sees how this event is going to occur. And so I take you to Zechariah chapter 14 and verse number four. And on that day, his feet will stand where? On the Mount of Olives. Where are the Mount of Olives? East of Jerusalem. What's Ezekiel's vision say? And I saw from the east of the city the glory of God returning, returning. East of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from the east to the west forming a great valley. Jump down to verse five. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Woo. We'll be in that processional. We'll be in that army coming back to set up his kingdom on the earth. Look at verse number nine, and it says, "Then the Lord will be the king over the whole earth, and on that day there will be one God, one Lord, and his name will be the only name, the only name. And now you see the purity, the holiness, when Jesus Christ returns and sets up his kingdom on the earth. Follow me now. Look at verse 21. And on that day there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord Almighty. I want to tell you, you see that link again between the glory of God and the holiness of God. There'll be no sin, uh, there'll be no defilement, there'll be no Canaanites in the temple, it will happen no more. Why? Because the king of glory has come in in all of his holiness uh, and he sets up his rule and reign on the earth. Mm -mm -mm. Mark 13, Jesus talks about that day and that event in verse 26. And at that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with what? Great power and what's the word? Glory. They'll see him coming back with great power and glory. Uh, the glory of God is coming back. We know his glory when we come together and worship and praise him. We understand his glory when we invite him to come into our lives and the glory of God comes and he dwells inside of us. But one day the entire earth will realize his glory and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, Let's go back to Ezekiel's vision. We're gonna to get to Psalm 24, I promise. Just stay with me, I'm setting up the groundwork here. When Ezekiel receives this vision of the glory of God returning back into the temple, two things happen. What did it say? It said he heard his voice like the sound of rushing waters. Verse, uh, the, the second verse, uh, and, and then it goes on to say, and he saw the radiant land full of his glory. What was his response to the glory of the Lord? The Bible says, I fell face down. Now listen to me, the word to worship literally means to bow down, to prostrate, your, prostate, prostrate, yeah, prostrate. Can I get that right? I always get confused. <laughs> to prostrate yourself before the Lord. I fell down, I bowed down, there was something about the awesomeness of the glory of God that can only elicit a response of praise and worship and adoration. We fall down in his presence. We bow down before him. Wow. Now, Psalm 24 is written by David. David's writing this psalm listen to me, before the Ark of the Covenant's gonna be taken back up into the tabernacle he had built for it, for the Ark of the Presidents to dwell. The Ark of the Presidents was, uh, was a, a wooden box lined in gold, and they, the priest had to carry it on their shoulders. They tried the wrong time. They tried to do it man's way. We sang that song, Shake Off Your Tradition. We can't worship God in man's way. They had to carry it on the shoulders of the priest. The first time they tried it man's way on the cart and the ark fell off and they tried to study the, the ark of the covenant, the glory of God, and they touched the glory of God and as a result of that, they died there on the spot. And so he stops at the house of Obed-Edom and he says, just wait right here, stay here until I give you the sign and signal. And finally they say, okay, it's time. Let's let the glory of God go back. And so over top of this ark were two angel's wings, who's the cherubim, and their, their wings touched over the heart of the ark. And on the top of the ark, it's known as the judgment seat initially because what is inside of that ark, it is the law, it is the law of the Ten Commandments. So they're inside the ark of the covenant. But every year when the priest would go in and sprinkle the blood, sprink, listen to me, sprinkle the blood on top of the ark, it, the 
the, the judgment seat turns into the mercy seat. And over top of the mercy seat is where the glory of God was said to dwell. And from time to time, that Shekinah glory of God would come down. It would be over there. So, so when they are carrying the ark into Jerusalem, getting them back to Mount Zion, what are they doing? They're taking the glory of God back into the holy city, back into the tabernacle. And so this psalm is written when the glory of God is returning, was coming in to Jerusalem. God was regarded as dwelling between the cherubim. But David reminds the people that even though God dwelt in his Shekinah glory, God can't be confined to a box. You can't hold God in a small box. And so he starts out Psalm 24 in this way, and turn back there if you would, Psalm 24, he starts it out this way, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Can't put God in a box, he has everything, everything is his, it all belongs to him. And the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Now what I wanna do this morning as we work our way through Psalm 24 is I wanna give you a pattern for worship and why we worship God and, and where it's at. And so you have this description of the glory of God coming into Zion and he gives the pattern for worship. And so he starts out, first of all, we need to worship our great king. Worship our great king. And he says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I, I think sometimes when we come in our quiet time, our time of prayer, our time and coming before the Lord, we just kind of try to rush into his presence and we blurt out our list of needs. I want this, I need this, I want this, please give me that. I've really been waiting for this for a long time, Lord. Speed it up a little bit. I really need this. And all of a sudden, David says, time out, wait a minute. You don't own anything. Everything's God's. It all belongs to him. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's not mine. I'm just a tenant. I'm a tenant living in God's earth, on God's earth. And whether you're the wealthiest land baron in the world or, or you're sleeping in the woods as a homeless person today, whatever is going on in your life today, you don't own this land. The earth is God's. It's God's. It all belongs to him and the fullness thereof. In fact, I will tell you at any time, God can evict his tenants. You say, where do you get that from? Luke 12 and 20, the gun God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. We can focus on our desires and our needs and our wants or a person or something else or all those things that we can't have. But worship pries you away from coveting what you want for yourself and you consider all the vast provisions of what God has instead. See, we, we, we struggle with covetousness. I gotta have more, 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 more stuff, more things, more whatever, and we struggle for more, 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 but worship prizes us, breaks that spirit of covetousness over us until we begin to realize that the earth belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and everything is his. And so we begin to worship by considering what he has rather than what I lack. Worship starts by focusing on what he has, I'll say it again, rather than what we lack. And instead of demanding a particular possession that, of his that we want, we kneel down and we accept what God has given us and we thank him and we worship him and we praise him because it's all from God. Woo. A true worshiper acknowledges everything is God's. A true worshiper understands my family's God's. My wife is God's. My kids is God's. It's all God's. All belongs to him. True worshiper realizes his friends are all of God's. True worshiper realizes his occupation came from God who gave us the strength to work and the mind to think. True worshiper realizes his home belongs to God. It's not my house. It's his. True worship believes everything I have, all of my possessions, all of my money, my bank account, everything else is God's. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 
Therefore, instead of grabbing for more, I worship God for all of his goodness and grace and all that he's entrusted into my care as a steward of all of God's stuff. And listen to me, a true worshiper understands that even life itself is God's gift. Therefore, I don't take it for granted or abuse it. As you begin with the knowledge of his ownership and greatness, you become alive to the creative work that God wants to do inside of you. Look at that next phrase. It says, he founded it on the seas and established it on the water. The God who established the earth on the water is able to create solid ground for him to do something special and unique in your life that he's never done before. Worship God and his greatness, his greatness. And so David looks at these priests before they're getting ready to carry this wooden box overlaid in gold, carrying the glory of God back up to Mount Zion, he starts out by reminding them, hey, God's not just in that box. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He established the earth upon the waters. He's a great God. Worthy of worship, worthy of worship. And we treat everything we have like it belongs to him as stewards of all that God has. Second, we worship our holy king. Our holy king. Pick it up with verse number three to six. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? I want you to repeat that verse. I'm gonna say it again like David said it to the priest. You're gonna read verse number four. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. You're not doing very good. It's on there. I don't know what's wrong with the middle screen. We gotta fix this place, Jason. Uh, who, 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 he who has clean hands, say it together, and a pure heart. Let's try it again. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. who may ascend to his holy hill. When we recognize the greatness of the Lord, immediately we are seized with our own smallness and our own sinfulness and our own unworthiness and our own... How do, how do we get then from where we are to where he is. So he asked the priest the question, who may ascend to the hill, to Mount Zion, with the ark, with the glory? Who may ascend to my hill? Clean heart, clean hands, pure heart, right? Speak what is wholesome and good, and does is not divided in their loyalties not divided between idolatry and God, who has a single focus on the Lord. That's the person who can ascend. It's interesting that the second time they got ready to bring the ark up into the holy city, they had to, they, they take a, I don't know, 20, 30 steps. I, I didn't go back and check it out, the exact dimensions. But then they'd have to stop and offer a sacrifice. Then they go another 30, 40, 50 steps, and then they stop and offer another sacrifice. They go a little bit further and offer another sacrifice. And what you have is a bloody trail all the way up to Mount Zion. <laughs> you know where I'm going here. The wonderful answer that gives us access into his presence is the blood of Jesus Christ. It is only by the blood that we can have access into his presence. And it purifies us from all of our contamination. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. Because, listen, I want to tell you, in myself, my hands aren't very clean. In myself, my heart's not very pure. In myself, I speak what is deceitful. In myself, I've divided in all my loyalties. But when I receive the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and I come through him by the blood of Jesus Christ, he imputes into me all of his righteousness, all of his holiness 
holiness, all of his goodness, all of his grace. Therefore, I can come into his presence. You see, the only one who perfectly had clean hands, the only one or, or speaks of right actions, the only one who perfectly had right intentions or a pure heart, the only one who had undivided loyalty to his father and never swore by an idol, the only one who had completely honest speech and who did not swear by what is false was Jesus Christ. So the bottom line is I can't get there. I can't come into his presence. I can't worship him until I know that I'm covered by his blood and I have his righteousness. Okay? The gift of, in the gift of salvation, he transfers his righteousness to us in response to his grace. We put on that new self and, and we walk in a manner worthy of him. Psalm 24, therefore, comes to me when I am outside of the temple. I'm not in the temple yet, but I'm ascending into that holy hill. And who may ascend into the hill? Who may come into his presence? Who may worship him? How, how do we do that? It is only by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ascend up to the hill of my God through the work of Christ, coupled with my desire and action to receive his help. The Holy Spirit seeks to reproduce the life of Jesus Christ in me, listen to me, so that I too can have what? Clean hands, a pure heart, undivided loyalty, and speech without deception. So he comes in, he imputes his righteousness, but the Holy Spirit starts his work in me of sanctification, so I am being made holy. I am be being renewed in my mind uh, into his glorious image. Uh, I am becoming more and more like him, so that what? I also need to have clean hands in my actions. I need to have a pure heart. Are my motive's right. My heart right. I also need to speak the truth. Speak honestly and speak what is wholesome and uplifting and edifying. And I also cannot be undivided in my loyalties and have idols on this side and the things I want to do and have Jesus on the other side. He will not be shared. He will not share his glory. He will not share his glory with anyone else or anything else. The glory of the Lord is holy, and holiness is required to experience the glory of the Lord. Let me say that to you again. The glory of the Lord by its very nature is holy. Therefore, holiness is required to experience his glory in my life. Do we long for God's presence? Do we long for his presence? I read Ezekiel 43 earlier in his vision. He says, if Israel will return to me, listen to me, if Israel will return to me, Away from their lifeless idols, they will dwell with me forever. That's a promise he gives to the nation of Israel. Now, if in your own life now you're sitting there, you feel like maybe, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, the glory of God. I've never experienced that. I've never felt that. I don't feel that closeness to his presence. Uh, and maybe you feel like the glory of the Lord has departed even out of your own life. I will tell you, if you come into that state, that position in your life and what's going on, it will affect your life, it affects your family, and ultimately it, it has had a drastic effect upon our nation. Because I don't think we see the glory of the Lord in many, many of our churches today. They're going through motions, they're saying the same thing, they're doing the same thing, they, they're repeating their prayers, but. The glory's not there. The glory's not there. Maybe it begins by missing church. You just think, well, yeah, it's just Sunday morning. I'm tired, Pastor. I got a lot going on. I don't need to come. I don't need to be there. Maybe I'll pick a little bit later up on TV. We'll watch it somewhere along the way. Maybe it's skipping your prayer time. Why do I need to pray? It's, I'm busy. I got so much going on. Maybe it's your time in the word of God. Maybe it's these kind of things. I want, I want to tell you, we need to steward the presence of God. While we know intellectually that God is with me all the time, I need to steward his presence. And how do I steward his presence? I take that intentionally, and so I seek God first in everything I do. 
And whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so in every aspect of my life, I am seeking to glorify God. And so I will have my prayer time. I will seek his face. I will get on my face before him. I will worship him, and I will enter into worship and praise. I will, I will express my love to him. I will serve him. I will dedicate my home, my life, and my family to him. Uh, all that is stewarding the presence of God. If we don't steward the presence of God like the nation of Israel did, phew, there goes the glory and we feel like stink mm, mm, mm. removing any idols or distractions to make space for God God wants to dwell in us but his glory will not be shared with another now it it wasn't enough for God just to return to his temple we must return to him which takes me to my third and final point, and that's the worship of our glorious king. Let's pick it up with verse number seven, and we will read that together. I'll start, and you'll repeat after me when I give you the cue. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, be lifted up, you ancient of doors, the king of glory may come in. I'm gonna ask the question, who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Oh, you did good that time. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, the king of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the king of glory. Woo! Now, now the scene shifts. You have the priests who are gonna take the ark up into Mount Zion, and so, they ask the question, who may ascend into his holy hill? And so he's talking about how do we get there? How do we get into his presence? Now in verses seven to 10, the priests are on the inside of the temple and God is wanting entrance. He says, let the king of glory in. Open up your doors. Open up your gates. Let him come into your temple. Let him, let, let, let him come in where you are. Let, let him come in. They're on the inside. In the New Testament, though, listen to me, and this is where you say, okay, that's all temple stuff, I don't get it. In the New Testament, we are the temples of God. The moment I say, Jesus, I need you, he comes and lives inside of me. We are the living temples of God. The Holy Spirit then urges us to open wide our gates and doors of our lives to the presence of Almighty God so that the King of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord mighty in battle. Open up your gates, all ye people. Now gates and doors, by their very nature, are designed to keep out the unwanted. So you have a gate in your front, you know, most, most of it don't have gates, but you know, gates around your property, whatever, I guess if you had a lot, you'd have a gate, but, and doors, right? And doors keep those who are wanted out. But the Lord is seeking entrance into every action, every word, every thought, and every motive of your heart and life. So I ask you a question, is there any area of your life you've posted a sign, do not enter here? Is there an area you say, I, that, that's walled off, God, that's just for me, that's just for my time, I, that, that, that's my fun time, that's my leisure time, just stay out of that area. God, don't come in here. I'm, I'm, I'm on my television watching a bunch of junk that's not going to edify me and mostly bring me down, but don't come into that area of my life. Don't come into the area of my child rearing. I, that, I'm, I'll, I'll do that the way I think is fit, and we don't do that well, or our marriage or whatever else we're looking at. Just, just stay out, and we keep our gates and doors closed. He will not come in without an invitation. The Holy Spirit says, open up your gates. Open up the gates. Revelation 3.20 says it this way. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and will eat with that person and they with me. It's not as much in this verse about a, a door of salvation, although we've got to open that door first to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about a door of fellowship. About a door relationship. 
Do we, do we want him to come in and spend time with us and us with him? Or is there areas we've got blocked off? If we are to receive him, it must be willingly, and it must be as with honor to the Lord our King. So who is the King of glory? We ask. The answer comes back, the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Who comes into my life, not just a companion to share my load, but he comes in as a warrior <laughs> to win the battles for us. The Lord, strong and mighty in battle, my conqueror, who when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. My conqueror who rose from the dead on the third day, and we'll be celebrating that in, oh, in great, great excitement next week. It's a warrior who wins the battles for me. And I will tell you, Jesus is an undefeated champion. Undefeated. What a powerful psalm of worship. We begin with the Lord of all the universe outside of us, the owner of all the earth. We wonder how we'll ever get up his holy hill. And he tells us, clean hands, pure heart, undivided loyalty. And then he himself comes to us and he chooses to dwell only in a surrendered life. So I ask you the question, have you opened up all your doors? Have you opened up all your gates? Let the King of glory come in, bow your heads and close your eyes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now listen, you may be here today and you haven't asked Jesus to come into your heart and life. He's knocking. He's knocking. The Holy Spirit's knocking this morning. He's knocking on your heart's door right now in this place. You got a choice. Are you gonna open your life to Jesus Christ and say, God, I need you. God, save me. God, come into my life. And the moment you do that, he comes in. The King of glory comes in. Your life is radically transformed. You have in that very moment everlasting life. It begins the moment you say, Jesus, I need you comes in and saves you, guarantees your future. If you're here today and say, Pastor Larry, pray for me. I need to give my life to Jesus this morning. Just raise your hand right now all over the building. If you want to give your life to the Lord and haven't received him as your Lord and Savior, today is a day of salvation. Today is a day of God's grace. Just slip your hand up for a moment. We will pray for you today. Yes, God bless you. Thank you so much. Somebody else, you'd say, pray for me. I'm ready to give my life to the Lord. Yes, God bless you. Thank you so much. To somebody else, you'd say, pray for me. Yes, sir. Yes, God bless you. You may slip your hand down. Thank you. Anyone else, you'd say, I need Jesus in my life. Slip your hand up for a moment so I can pray for you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. You may slip your hand down. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God bless you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. King of glory is marching in to a lot of lives today. Oh, what a celebration. Just like on the day of Palm Sunday, we are going to celebrate with you this morning. Hallelujah. Now, let, let me ask you another question. The first thing Jesus did when he got in Jerusalem is he cleansed the temple. I want to ask you, maybe, maybe there's some, the Holy Spirit's speaking to you today about some rooms you've blocked off, some areas of your life you've shut down, you haven't opened it up to the Lord yet, you're still hanging on to that habit, you're still hanging on to that addiction, you're still hanging on to that, what you're viewing, you're still hanging on to that in your life, and it's, it's a barrier between you and God, it's keeping you from intimate fellowship. You say, I want to open up all the doors, I want God to come in and cleanse my life, cleanse my temple, cleanse, cleanse my heart. Cleanse my eyes, cleanse me today, cleanse my thoughts. You got anger, maybe unforgiveness, you know what it is. Holy Spirit will speak to you very directly about it. He, 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 he's, he knows you intimately, so he knows exactly what you're going through and what's going on, so he'll speak to you about that area that you're struggling in. And when you open your heart to him, King of glory will come in and cleanse your temple, hallelujah. Just slip up your hand, you say, that's me, I, I need prayer, there's stuff in my life shouldn't be there, I know it. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, all over this building, yes. 
Yes, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to ask, we got a, an amazing prayer team. They're going to come around the front. They're going to prepare to pray for you. In just a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to, as soon as we stand to our feet, everybody who raised their hand and said, I need Jesus in my life, or you raised your hand and said, there's some stuff I'm dealing with and I need his grace and forgiveness this morning. I'm going to, as soon as we stand up, don't hesitate, don't wait, don't, don't hold back. Just come right now to these altars. Find grace, find mercy, find forgiveness. Let's all stand together. Everybody standing. Hallelujah. You begin to come right now from wherever you're at. Begin to make your way down here. They'll pray with you. If you don't know Jesus, they'll show you how you can be saved, how you can know the Lord today. You'll find him as your Lord and Savior. He will come in. He'll make you a new creature. Come right now. You said, I need Jesus in my life. Come. This is the invitation for you to make that confession. I'm giving everything to the Lord. I'm surrendering my life to him. I'm not holding back. If there's anything in there that's been keeping you out of his presence or keeping you from worshiping him, come right now. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. Hallelujah. Begin to make your way down down here. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Now, church, let's do what they did on that Palm Sunday. Don't let a rock come and take your seat. Let's begin to lift our hands and praise him and glorify God. I thank you, mighty God. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We worship you. We praise you. God, you are good. You are good. You're good. Everything is yours, Lord, the earth and all that is in it. We will praise you for that. We'll thank you, God, for the way you blessed us, the, the way you've been good to us, God. We thank you, Jesus, for every provision, for caring, for guiding, for protecting. I thank you that you're the good shepherd. You're the great shepherd. I thank you today. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, we praise you. We praise you. Uh, Lord, let us lift up our hearts and let the King of glory come in today. We worship you. We praise you. We exalt you, mighty God. Hallelujah. You're good. You're good. We worship you, Jesus. Oh, you are worthy. You are worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Testament, they wave palm branches. Begin to wave your hand to the Lord. Welcome into the city. Welcome into your lives. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands. Praise Him today. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we bless you. We make room in our hearts, room in our lives, God. Room, Lord Jesus, for your dwelling, for your presence, for your glory. We thank you, mighty God. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Shake the ground of our lives. Bless you, we praise you, mighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For my tradition, break down the walls. For my religion, your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground. For my tradition, break down the walls.
just a, a thought as you leave. The earth is the Lord's and everything, everything in it. I'm so quick to gain possession and lobby and hoard and get and obtain. And just as we approach Resurrection Week, as we approach Good Friday, as we approach to understand that it's all His, that He, that He alone is worthy, that He alone is worthy of all glory, of all honor, of all praise. And maybe those things that we've been striving for, those things that we've been desiring, those things that we've been pushing for, it's just, God, God, empty me. God, empty me. God, I want, it, I, I want my life to usher your glory. I want my life to speak of you. I want my life to, I want my family. I want my house. I want e- everything to declare the splendor and glory of your majesty and who we are who you are, who you are, Lord. Can we eat one more time, one more time? Can we just close a prayer? Father, today I thank you. God, I thank you that you are good. God, we thank you that you are here. We thank you for just this beautiful picture of prophetic, this prophetic gift that you've unveiled to us this morning. And Lord, I pray, I pray, God, if there's those things that we've gated up, those things that we've bottled in, those things that we've tried to own and possess, Lord, we make again the commitment to surrender, to let go, God, to give you room. Every area, every cabin, every all the secret stuff, God, we lay it before you. God, may our life this week, may our life tomorrow declare your glory, your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love, your wonder. God, we are in all of who you are. We give you praise and glory. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, one more time, give the Lord praise. Just a couple things. These altars are gonna be open if you need prayer. They'll hang out here for a little while longer. Take those cards, man, invite somebody back next week. Three service times next week, three service times next week, 8, 30, 10, and 11, 30. Make sure you pick one of those. We'd love to have you back with the guests. Have a great week in the Lord. Good Friday service, all kinds of things going on. Have a great week in the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the Son.
into the city of our hearts.
I'm not afraid to die. 